Welcome to part three of this series. To get the most out of this training, I highly recommend that you watch the videos in order. Part one involved exploring the scope of the issue of sexual assault, defining what trauma is and how it remaps the brain, and finally how trauma survivors can present to us. In part two, I discussed the trauma-informed skill set, how it fits with our current anxiety management techniques, and how to best respond to a disclosure of a history of sexual assault. In this video, I will delve into practical strategies for managing trauma patients. Then I'll explore how we can take care of ourselves in this demanding work. My vision for the future is the next topic, and I'll conclude with the key take home messages of this series. Let's begin with the practical application of all the theory I've covered. These approaches are applicable to patients with a history of all kinds of trauma and to anxious and phobic patients in general. Some tips are especially geared to sexual assault survivors. I have drawn these strategies from my own practice, talking with survivor patients and current research. Not all tools will be applicable to all patients. Everybody is different and people like to engage with us in various ways. Choose what works best for your unique situations. Let's break down the entire patient experience and discuss each stage in detail. Firstly, before appointments. For booking new patients, reception can ask the patient if they have a preference for either a female or male dentist and book them accordingly. Avoid booking the initial appointment for a known trauma survivor in a rushed emergency slot or anywhere you are very pressured for time. The exception would be if they have an emergency. Train all staff to be trauma informed. If a known survivor is coming in, have a team huddle and prepare everyone to make their best effort. Consider a general screening question on your new patient form like is there anything in your past that might make a difference to how your dental care is provided? Or even just things you want us to know? These questions leave it open for patients to choose what they want to say. This screening question is ideally in addition to asking about any previous bad dental experiences. It's best if the form is online or posted to them as it gives patients more control and time. Know that an emergency appointment will make survivors feel more powerless than treatment that has been planned. Keep in mind that any dental trauma can link straight back to old distress. In fact, it's common for teeth and mucosa to be damaged during sexual assault. For example, one of my patients had a hard object thrown at her by an offender. This decoronated her upper central incisor. Bruising of the palate from forced oral sex in children is also common. For known trauma survivors, here are options that have worked for me for before appointments. Firstly, encourage patients to have a trusted support person with them during the appointment. This is a huge help because they can be a comfort if the patient gets triggered. Patients often don't want to show how vulnerable they are. The support person helps to contain the whole experience. Next, they could bring a comforting object, for example, a stuffed animal or music they love. Provide information about what to expect. A quick familiarisation visit to meet everyone and check out the surgery can be very helpful. Include as much information as you can on your website so people can engage with you. Encourage patients to arrange something lovely and enjoyable after the visit. Encourage patients to practise slow, deep breathing positive self-talk or distraction techniques, if they find these helpful, ahead of appointments. As the patient walks in, consider things from their perspective. Are the first contacts welcoming, respectful and engaging? Offer water in the waiting room. This brings patients back into their body, out of their worrying head. Have discreet pamphlets or fact sheets about sexual assault and other topics in the waiting room. These should be clearly written and accessible in a variety of formats and languages. Use the waiting room to recognise diversity and make people welcome from all backgrounds. 
For example, have a sign indicating that this is an inclusive practice and that patient safety comes first. Another way to do this is having information about the white ribbon and other campaigns. Patients seeing the friendly faces of all staff is very helpful. Avoid ignoring the patient no matter how busy you are. Having name tags for the staff can really help and or photos of the staff with their names displayed on a wall. This helps survivors identify and become familiar with the staff, which reduces anxiety. Ideally, avoid keeping the patient waiting for a long time. Consider the waiting room and reception areas from a survivor's perspective. Are they inviting, comfortable, quiet, separate from surgery sounds, and full of interesting content and distractions? Be aware of strong odours, such as air fresheners or floral arrangements. The critical thing here is to vary the smells so one doesn't become associated in the patient's mind with your surgery. This may trigger traumatic memories from childhood whenever they smell it, despite it being nothing to do with you personally. This applies to how you smell as well, for example regarding deodorant. Consider how close the chairs are to each other and whether the exit is easily accessible. If you can, offering patients a waiting area outside, like a veranda, can be hugely helpful. Think about what magazines are on display. Neutral topics like cooking, gardening, the newspaper or local paper and what's on in Melbourne, for example, are all great. Be aware that magazines with sexualised images, including bodybuilding and many women's magazines, are commonly triggering. Consider also that children's toys can trigger distressing childhood memories. The best options here are also neutral, like Lego, paper and pencils, blocks and colouring books. These are all much better than dolls, teddy bears, action figures and gendered toys like princesses. Ideally contain toys to one area of the waiting room. Be aware of oral health posters with graphic images of caries or other pathology, as survivors may catastrophize this information. Consider the sounds in the reception and waiting room. Are you blasting out commercial radio chosen by the reception staff? This can have a big impact on the anxiety levels of patients as they wait. Calming music usually helps patients the most. Next, meeting the dentist. The receptionist introducing the dentist can build a bridge. From my experience, the dentist coming out and meeting the patient in the waiting room shows great respect and puts people at ease. Consider what you call yourself. Your first name generally feels much better for survivors than the more distant and clinical doctor and your surname. Avoid using personal pronouns, just the patient's preferred name. For new patients, given we most likely won't know their history, shake their hand, ideally avoiding touching their shoulder or the double handshake. To get the open communication going straight away, you can ask the patient how they prefer to be greeted in future and follow this. Consider who walks first when going into the surgery. Patient preferences will vary depending on their past experiences. If you are not sure, have the survivor walk in front of the dentist, but see what feels right for each individual patient. Consider having a small memento or photo of something personal that patients see as they pass. This encourages a safe but personal topic for discussion. For example, is that you hiking? I love to travel. Do you play the piano? I play guitar. What kind of music do you like? We are about to learn very personal things about the patient in the surgery and this exchange evens up the balance. Now to during appointments. Consider the five S's of the surgery and environment. I have broken this down into sights, smells, sounds, sensations, and services. Firstly, sights. Sit alongside the patient. Don't stand over them, give power back. Avoid hovering over the patient when you are sitting or working. Remove your loops and mask for all conversations. Take the instruments out of you or tray off so the patient is not seeing blood and gore when they sit up. Maximise daylight in the surgery. Have ceiling distractions. 
Ideally, these are not too challenging and engage creativity. Things that capture the patient's attention and occupy them. Provide other distractions like colourful prints, a TV, fish tank and more. Check what the preferred door position is and if you are unsure, leave it open. This leads to reduced stress and greater safety as some patients may feel less trapped. Smells. Ideally have no smell in the surgery. Keep it neutral. Avoid aftershave and perfume as they can trigger memories. If the smell of latex is an issue for a patient, use nitrile or vinyl gloves. There are some that are comfortable. Sounds. Avoid speaking loudly and quickly as it's intimidating and frightening. Speech is ideally slow and calm. Minimise unpleasant noises as much as you can as survivors are more sensitive. Noise cancelling headphones designed for dentistry are on their way. Research confirms that music reduces pain in dental appointments and releases dopamine. The patient can bring their own headphones in for infection control and we can offer a music menu. Encourage survivors to bring in their favourite music, for example on their iPod or phone if they like. Have a quiet room as part of the practice. This can be an area for private discussions. Patients can take time out there before and after treatment, reducing anxiety. Now onto sensations. Offer a rolled up towel or back cushion to open up the chest, which can help patients to breathe properly. I have found this very helpful. Be gentle. Avoid quick movements and ask permission before touching. Ensure all touch is respectful, gentle and purposeful. Offer patients objects with interesting textures to hold. For example, the fidget widget, counting coins in their pockets, beautiful stones or squeezing a stress ball. Keep patients in the supine position for the minimum necessary time. Ensure adequate LA and pain relief and initially, minimise body contact and unintentional touch as much as you can until you are sure that the patient is comfortable with it. Take your cues from the patient. Our compassionate energy has a big effect, even if we are holding back physically. Services. For Victorian dentists and our patients at any time, duty workers are on call at CASA to help. You can call your nearest centre or CASA house in the city. For the rest of Australia, services are set up differently in each state. Please see the website links at the end with national service directories. It's worth looking up your local sexual assault or rape crisis centre and having the phone number handy to give out, just in case. We can get advice and support as health professionals and also refer our patients to them. Community health centres are another potentially helpful source of information and some have counsellors that work with sexual assault. Consider an expanded role for a female dental assistant. Women are often more comfortable speaking to another woman than to a male dentist. Still looking at what happens during appointments, I want to focus on treatment planning and all discussions. I know you are doing this already, but the importance here can't be overstated. It's critical to give careful, clear, and thorough explanations of all tasks and procedures and check for understanding. Ensure the rationales for all options and recommendations are made explicit. At the end of appointments, give information on the steps you recommend patients take next so they can be discussed and planned. Encourage questions and be very generous with information. Show patients what you are talking about if they are open X-rays and an intraoral camera or mirror all help patients to retain the information. For when you discuss home care, I have found the electric brush, air flosser and other devices very helpful due to their novelty effect. It seems psychologically easier and more fun for survivor patients who are very commonly blocked about flossing. Tell people how long it will take and break procedures up to suit the patient. Allow the patient to set the agenda for the first part of the appointment. Give patients your full, relaxed and unhurried attention. This is of the utmost importance. 
In my experience, it is usually in these spaces that patients open up, especially when coupled with empathy. Tears can be released and sensitive information can come out that is often critical for the care of that patient. For example, their deep fears and hopes. This space allows a deeper connection and results in a much better quality of care. From my experience, it really helps to explain to the patient that consultation fees are fixed and extra talking won't add to their bill. Validate all concerns as normal following trauma, no matter what they are, and especially if the patient says they're stupid or crazy. The informed consent process for survivors involves careful consideration. Mutually agreed upon treatment plans are essential. Remember that the fight flight mode most patients are in hijacks the thinking brain. Please see part one in this series. Thus, it is only possible for patients to make decisions once their arousal level is in a window where they can actually think. You may need to reassure the patient and wait for them to become calm before making treatment decisions together. Some patients may not be able to make a decision at that time and may need to take written information home and review it with you later. Providing written resources, both in paper form and ideally on your website, is invaluable and helps to give patients back control. Assume they are not listening fully as they are so nervous. This is especially relevant for the patients who dissociate. Know that they can't take it in. This is another benefit of having a support person present as they can listen and remember what you say for later. Comprehensive information about various topics can include the pros, cons and logistics of procedures and links to further resources online. These all really help to educate patients and empower them. Avoid asking about sexual assault directly. Ask open, general questions. For example, are there any parts of dental treatment that are particularly difficult for you? Is there anything we can do to help you feel more comfortable? Really listening is key. Find out the patient's motivations, hopes, dental IQ, what inspires them in general, and where they're coming from. Speak to their interests rather than overloading them with information to educate or sound interesting to them. We shouldn't be doing most of the talking. Slow things down and take the necessary time. Ensure understanding by avoiding dental jargon. Ideally use lay words. I have found it extremely helpful to use analogies. This allows the unfamiliar to be understood instantly. There is a link at the end to an analogies in dentistry book online. Let's turn our attention to during procedures. Confirming with the patient their ability to stop the procedure at any time and developing a stop cue together have been shown to improve experiences of survivors within the healthcare system. Please be aware that some patients are not great at this, so you just can't hand over responsibility for stopping. We must be extremely observant the whole time, pick up cues for how the patient is traveling and stop if needed. For example, if they are fidgety, sweaty or wringing their hands, this all indicates anxiety. Patients often can't use their voice, but speak loudly with their bodies to indicate their discomfort. Regularly check in with the patient and see how they're going. Check in with ourselves as well. If a patient's distress causes you distress, be careful to avoid making it their problem. As you remember from the first video, they already feel responsible for everything. We must maintain a boundary here. The offender made the victim responsible for their emotions, and we don't want to repeat this. Offer to cover patients with a blanket. This makes them feel less exposed and more secure. To satisfy infection control requirements, the patient has to bring their own blanket, or you could use towels that you wash. The semi-supine chair position is ideal if possible. If not, explaining why the supine position offers the best quality of treatment helps patients to accept it. It's imperative to address any heightened gag reflex. For example, with distraction, breathing techniques, decongestant spray, 
rubber dam, salt on the tongue, having patients insert things like x-rays themselves, and more. However, it's important to avoid certain pharmacological methods to reduce gagging, like Valium, as they have been shown to promote flashbacks. They take away the patient's sense of control and mimic being drugged. For some patients, allowing them to monitor the procedure in the mirror or with an intraoral camera works to increase their feeling of safety. Give advance warnings of any potential pain. Avoid encouraging patients to be stoic martyrs. Encourage the patient to do whatever they can to be the most comfortable wherever possible. For example, keeping their coat on and the preferred door and chair positions where possible. Remind patients to breathe and help them through any panic and anxiety with sensitivity. Avoid talking to the assistant about something unrelated and ignoring the patient or talking over them. However, if the patient is keen, chattering away about an area of interest to them can help distract them, but they must be included in the conversation. Ask the patient about dissociation and whether it's a positive, happy place you can leave them to enjoy or a fear-based reaction that creates distress for them. They may have no control over whether it happens. If a patient is dissociating and they seem distressed or want you to help them avoid this, speak to them softly, ask them how they are going and remind them where they are to bring them back to the present. Remain calm, be very gentle and patient. Offer them a glass of water as this helps bring them back into their body. Explanations and reassurance help allay the fears that lead to dissociation in the first place. Note that anxiety related to dissociation is very common just before or straight after sedation or general anaesthetic. Returning to consciousness is a common trigger for memories as both dissociation and being drugged can happen as part of sexual assault. Therefore, as patients come out of GA or sedation, they can become very distressed and be unable to articulate why. Continuing tips for procedures. Negotiate the chair angle or proceed in small increments. Tell patients how much longer things will take so they can track procedures. Emotions only become intolerable because it feels like they'll never end. Validate the patient's courage and energy. This motivates people, unlike the old judgmental approach. Positivity and warmth in the surgery helps to minimise avoidance behaviour and late cancellations. Offer patients choices as much as possible, however tiny they may be. For example, what sunglasses they prefer. In my experience, I have found that as you get to know the patient, humour can be very helpful to appease anxiety for everyone. It's essential that the dentist and staff work very well as a cohesive team. Mutual respect must be shown, with the dentist displaying manners, sympathy, sensitivity and gentleness. All staff are ideally skilled, supportive, reassuring, accepting and display confidence in the dentist. Next, after appointments. Encourage patients to offer helpful strategies for their next visit. Open communication is the key. You can also have an anonymous written feedback form at reception. Ensure your receptionist doesn't hold the patient at the desk for long. They are often exhausted after the session. All staff on the reception desk are ideally warm, friendly and not anxious. Patients have reported to me that sometimes staff keep them at the desk talking and sharing stories. This is coming from a very good place, but isn't always helpful. The staff need to take their cues from the patient and try to be sensitive to whether the patient wants to keep talking or not. From my experience, the follow-up call to the patient is best from the dentist, not the staff. You can answer questions directly, maintain confidentiality, and it really shows that you care. For certain patients, following up by exchanging text messages also works very well. Have information about referrals for more support. For example, to CASA, Blue Knot, DHHS, and see the other links at the end. Ideally, 
book the patient's next appointment on the day of the current one. This helps to minimise fear-driven avoidance. A useful approach for some patients is that instead of booking their next appointment, you could have them call on a day that they feel ready to come in, and they can take any available appointment on that day. This minimises late cancellation issues and helps the patient to resist the urge to back out of appointments. As you can see, these strategies all involve giving patients more control and power. I want to say that this doesn't undermine our credibility or expertise in any way. On the contrary, it demonstrates inclusivity and care. I also want to clarify that although I've given many practical tips, they are all there for your consideration and it's up to you to implement what feels manageable and right for your practice. You might start by changing only a few things to get the ball rolling and see how these go before taking the next step. Even small alterations can have a very significant effect on individual patients. The fact is, no matter what lengths we go to, patients will inevitably be triggered by their trauma at times. It's unavoidable, especially for those with a history of more severe trauma. The way we handle these situations when they arise is the critical thing. Being open and caring rather than defensive and keen to discuss how to make things easier for the future are the key approaches. Let's turn our attention from helping our patients to strategies to help us cope as dentists. We need support from the outside too. Trauma survivors are some of our most complex and challenging patients. From my experience, this is highly demanding and rewarding work. We are fully engaged on all levels and giving very high quality attention and energy over long periods. This work can be very draining emotionally, physically and psychologically, especially if the dentist is a trauma survivor themselves. We must be on the lookout to prevent and recognise vicarious trauma. This is a psychological term referring to changes in a person that can occur when they are repeatedly exposed to traumatic material. It's also known as when the work gets inside you. Vicarious trauma is a normal response to repeated exposure to trauma, not a weakness or failure of an individual. We as dentists endure repeated exposures to anxiety and constantly use our empathy as a tool to help patients. This involves accessing our own dark emotions very regularly so we can relate. Vicarious trauma can manifest as short-term reactions or long-term effects. For example, intrusive reactions like obsessive thoughts, nightmares and ruminations on an issue. Or hyperarousal reactions like hypervigilance, control issues and difficulty concentrating. Other common indicators to look out for include fatigue, anxiety, depression, an impaired immune system, sleep and appetite disturbances, low self-esteem, loss of interest in work, having no time or energy for yourself or others, disruptions to relationships, and feeling a profound lack of trust in other people and the world. Research shows that the level of vicarious trauma is directly related to the level of exposure to trauma. For example, the number of hours per week working with traumatized patients. Prioritising self-care can both regulate stress and help develop the ability and strength to cope. Types of self-care include physical resources, as in using the body and senses, social and recreational resources, which involve connecting to friends, family or creative activities as outlets, cognitive options include changing how we think about things, spiritual resources include religious beliefs and spirituality, and finally, verbal self-care resources involve putting the intense emotions that we feel into words, such as journaling or stand-up comedy. Self-care strategies include maintaining interests and connections with people that are completely separate to work. For example, I love playing music and bushwalking with friends. Taking breaks at and from work and getting good at recognising when you need these is critical.
Other ways to look after ourselves include debriefing, giving and accepting support and positive feedback, body care with sleep and physical activities like exercise, mindfulness, and my personal favorite, humor. The issue of vicarious trauma is not about the resilience of a particular individual. Vicarious trauma happens at work. So for success, we must think about how work is set up. Structures, organizations, and the wider social context all need to be considered. Research shows that organizational support can be critical in helping employees vent, process, and debrief about traumatic material. Unsupportive administration and obstacles to providing services are predictive of higher burnout rates. For us, the ADAVB offers a counselling service for family and workplace matters. They also have an HR advisory service and help with disputes. From what I have seen working with CASA, we can learn a lot from our counselling and social work colleagues. They have amazing support structures set up across the industry for all their workers, including ongoing debriefing and mentoring. Despite the demanding nature of this field, therapists who work with trauma survivors report appreciating life more fully, taking life more seriously, and having a greater scope of understanding of others and themselves. They report forming new friendships, deeper intimate relationships, and feeling inspired by the daily examples of their patients' courage, determination, and hope. To summarize, compassion for our patients begins with, and is only possible when, we have compassion for ourselves. Like the oxygen mask analogy from flying in a plane. Trauma is an issue of profound social and political importance, affecting not only individuals, but whole communities. Across all fields, we have been in denial of the enormous cost of trauma to society. Epigenetics is now confirming the transgenerational dimensions of trauma. Our mental health units, drug and alcohol detox services, prisons and medical rooms are all full of trauma survivors. The whole system needs to appreciate the impact of trauma and change accordingly. In my opinion, we need to develop new structures like referral networks and formulate policies and practice guidelines that meet the needs of survivors of sexual assault and trauma. We need to develop more educational tools for both providers and survivors. The curricula of all healthcare providers should be re-evaluated to ensure the care of survivors is addressed. We need to shift the basic questions we ask and the focus on how trauma continues to impact the survivor today. Techniques for patients are only a part of what needs to happen. The healthcare system is currently set up for short-term interventions and healing trauma can't be rushed. It's a process. At the moment, people present to multiple services over a long period of time. Care is fragmented with inadequate referral and follow-up pathways. Collaboration across systems should include the full range of human services, like the health, social services, education, and criminal justice systems. Imagine a world in which all services are trauma-informed, from schools to hospitals, police and aged care, both government and private. I'm talking about change on a much bigger system scale. Speaking of this, I want to encourage an increased awareness of the power structures in society that encourage sexual abuse in the first place. Working together, we can create new models. There are many challenges for us as dentists here. For example, the people who most need our help are often the most difficult to engage. It's a paradox. There are many patient factors making things more complex, like high rates of mental illness and unreliability keeping appointments. We're not currently reimbursed for taking extra time to address any psychosocial needs. The focus on procedures and tools in dentistry often makes the encounter quite one-sided in terms of communication. The high cost of running a dental practice means time is limited and pressured. Health insurance rewards invasive procedures much more than preventive ones. And finally, 
This whole area is very complex and overwhelming and we haven't had training in how to cope well. Despite these challenges, there is a lot to gain. My experience is that if you take the necessary time and build high quality trusted relationships, you may lose money initially. However, you gain massive loyalty and referrals, which more than make up for this. In fact, I would argue that spending more time initially saves you time in the long run. It also leads to greatly increased positivity and satisfaction with all encounters for both patients and dentists. Once trust and rapport have been established, there is not a great difference in how long things take compared to non-traumatised patients. Plus, you can't put a price on the feeling you get and the emotional rewards. In my opinion, like the satisfaction gained from removing huge chunks of old calculus, with survivors, we are often starting at such an extremely difficult place in so many ways, the potential for positive contribution is enormous. This is an opportunity to boost the reputation of our profession in the community. Our overarching principle is to firstly do no harm. With this greater sensitivity and deeper understanding, we will avoid unwittingly re-traumatising our patients. Healing trauma involves working with the body and nurturing relationships. As dentists, we can do both and be catalysts for big change. Please watch the videos for survivors of sexual assault that are part of this project. I'm sure you'll be as moved by the interviews as I was and that you'll find the content most valuable for your practice, as I hope this has been. As dentists, we are leaders and authority figures. My hope is that this project will help us become more capable in this capacity, with a new empathy and sensitivity to this population. The approaches I have discussed will not only impact the obvious and more vocal minority of trauma survivors, but also the silent majority. These patients won't give us any indication of their history at all. I know I've presented a great volume of information to you over this series, and I'd like to summarise things now with the following key take-home messages. One. Sexual assault is much more widespread than previously thought, involving one in three women and one in six men. Two, feeling powerless is generally a trigger for memories and anxiety to return. The dental situation has multiple triggers as it parallels the sexual assault scenario in so many ways. There is a global issue with widespread dental avoidance by this population. Three, Trauma, including sexual assault, remaps the autonomic nervous system, which gets stuck in fear-driven survival mode. This is not necessarily fixed for life and may be resolved with hard work over time. Four, the majority of the time we won't be told, so we need to know what to look for and how survivors will present to us. Integrating the trauma-informed principles as universal precautions can only benefit all patients. Five, we need to think and plan in advance about how to handle situations. This involves training the whole team. Consideration needs to be given to the physical and emotional boundaries that best serve our patients and ourselves. Six, the practical strategies for patient care I have suggested are all based on giving back control, choice and power to survivors. Self-care is equally critical when working in this demanding area. And finally, seven, healing from trauma involves connection and nurturing relationships. The quality of our relationship with patients is the most important factor for success. Strong, compassionate relationships are the most powerful way to reduce anxiety for everyone involved. They also bring survivors back to their sense of belonging being cared for and valued. This can have an incredibly profound impact on their lives. Thank you for watching.